I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today's topic will be quadratic equations. Well, um, the last thing I would like to do uh, talking about quadratic equations and probably about any kind of equations or some theoretical topic is just to give you a formula. Okay, this is quadratic equation. This is the formula for its solutions. Just use it. Um, well, primarily because this is definitely not the purpose of these lectures. The purpose is to basically explain how the real thinking is going on behind it and what leads to these equations and solutions and the methodology, etc. So, that's why I will try to do it by introducing certain um, different categories of quadratic equations, more and more complex, and come up with solutions just as if I will try to solve it myself from the first time without knowing any kind of formula. So, I don't suppose you know any formula, and let me just try to derive all these um, formulas and solutions in this particular case as we go. So, first of all, what is a quadratic equation? Um, anything which has a form of this, where a is not equal to zero, represents a quadratic equation where x is unknown, a, b, and c are known coefficients. Well, first of all, when we talk about equations, we have to think about where exactly we are trying to solve this particular equation. What's the domain of our unknown x in this particular case? Well, there are two traditional domains um, for uh, solving equations, and quadratic in particular. Um, the first one being uh, domain of all real numbers, and the second one is complex numbers. So today we will talk only about real numbers. So a, b, and c are real numbers, and x is a solution which we are looking within the domain of real numbers only. All right, so that's the definition of what's the quadratic equation. Well, obviously solution is any real number x which being substituted to this uh, expression will result in zero. Okay. So, now we are facing the problem. Let's solve this particular solution. Let's find all the possible um, values of x, real values, um, which represent the solution to this equation. And quite frankly, if I first time I look at this equation, I just have no idea how to approach it. I'm just thinking that, well, there are some simple uh, quadratic equations which I know how to solve. For instance, this is the simplest quadratic equation, which being represented in this particular form would look like x squared minus 1 is equal to 0, because this is a, an invariant transformation of this equation to this equation. We subtract 1 from both sides. Now, in this particular case, a is equal to 1, b is 0, and c is equal to minus 1. Okay, so this is an example, or this is an example of this particular equation, and I can just guess how to solve this equation. Obviously, it has two different solutions. x is equal to 1, and x is equal to minus 1. Or, in abbreviated form, we can have plus minus 1, which is the same thing. So these two and this one mean exactly the same thing. All right, so we know how to solve this equation. Well, let's try to um, make a little bit more complicated example. What if my equation is not this, but something like this? Can I solve this equation? Well, I can actually try to do exactly the same thing as in the previous case. I um, use the invariant transformation at R to both sides. I will get this. Now, if R is not negative, 
then solution exists, and one of them is x equals to square root of r, and another is minus square root of r. By the way, when we are talking about square root, you always have to remember we are talking about arithmetic value of the square root, which means the positive number square of which will give r. So in case of r is equal to 25, square root is 5, not minus 5. So square root is 5. And uh, when I am saying minus in front of it, that's what minus 5 actually is. So x is equal to 5 and minus 5 are both solutions to x squared equals to 25. So basically what I'm saying is that I can solve this equation or this equation more or less as easily. Well, let's complicate it a little bit more. What if I have this one? Well, I can do exactly the same thing as before but I will use x plus s. I subtract r in both cases. Obviously, in this case, r is supposed to be less than 0 or equal to 0. Or I can go, you know what, it just looks a little easier. It's silly to write it this way. Let's use it this way. And now the requirement is r is greater or equal to 0. That's kind of easier, right? So how to solve this particular equation? Well, same way as before, I can say that x minus s is equal to square root of r, or x minus s is equal to minus square root of r, as in the previous case and applying uh, invariant transformation of adding s in both cases, I can have two solutions. <coughs> One of them is x is equal to s plus square root of r, and x is equal to s minus square root of r. Two solutions. Or x is equal to s plus minus square root of r. All right, you see, we can solve very easily a certain number of equations. Well, one more complication, and then we will go to the main one. What if I have this? No big deal. Again, from the very beginning, I assume um, that a is not equal to 0, by the way, the same as in this case. That a times x minus s squared is equal to r. Now, since a is not equal to 0, dividing by a is in, in invariant transformation. So x minus s squared is equal to r over a. And everything else goes as before, the only uh, condition is r over a greater or equal to 0, from which follows that s, x is equal to s plus square root of r over a, and x is equal to s minus two solutions. So this is the most complicated equation which we don't really, <clears throat> which we don't really have to think twice about how to solve. This, on the other hand, is slightly different. But let's compare these two equations. One of them, which we know how to solve, and another we don't. Let me just put uh, solutions to these equations here. <clears throat> and s minus r over a. OK, these are two solutions to this equation. And this we don't know. Well, 
Let's compare these two things. Maybe I can somehow transform, preferably invariantly transform, this into this. Let's open up this expression. So it's a times x squared minus 2xs plus s squared. Right? That's what x minus s squared is. Minus r is equal to 0. <clears throat> Multiplied ax squared, which looks like this, by the way. That's why I was using x. Minus 2asx. Asx. Plus a s square minus r is equal to zero. Well, you see, it's really more or less very much like this one, where this is b and this is c. This is b, the coefficient with x, and this is c which is a free element. So, if I will be able to find a, uh, uh, S and R, S and R, in such a way that this expression is equal to B and this expression is equal to C, then I can use this formula to get the final solution. So this formula expresses the solution to this equation in terms of S and R. But if S and R are expressed as B and C, then using the same formula, just using B and C instead of S and R, I will have the solution to this equation in terms of A, B, and C, which is definitely what's required. So all I have to do is, using these two equivalences, find representation of S and R in terms of A, B, and C. Well, let's do it. It's really not very difficult. So, from this equation, from this equivalence of minus 2as is equal to b, I can immediately derive that s is equal to minus b over to a. Correct? Remember, a is not equal to 0, so dividing by 0 um, is allowed. So s is equal to b over minus 2a. Great. Now I can use it here to find r represented uh, from this equation. So it's a times s squared, which is this which is b squared over 4a squared, right? That's what s squared is. Minus r is equal to 0. Now I don't need this. And I have my expression of r. By the way, a can be reduced here. So this is multiplication. This is a squared. So r is equal to b squared over 4a. Now, this and this are representations of r and s in terms of a and b. Oh, wait a moment. I'm sorry. It's not equal to 0. It's equal to c. I made a little mistake here. Sorry about this. So, r is equal to uh, b squared over 4a minus c. Right? r goes to this way, c goes to this way. This is my expression. I was very much surprised that c did not participate in the formula. All right. So, now, since my R and S are represented in terms of A, B, and C, I can just substitute it here. 
and I have a solution, basically, right? So let's just use these two representations, put it here, and off we go. So the first solution is no, what? <coughs> let me write these two formulas here. S is equal to minus B over 2A, and R is equal to B squared over 4A minus C. Now I have some real estate to put my formulas. So, using these expressions for R and S in terms of A, B, and C, I will substitute it into this expression for X, and I, get, and I have two solutions. Solution number one, let's put number, index number, one and two. So, solution number one is equal to S plus the square root. S is minus B over 2A plus square root of r, which is this. Um, if you don't mind, I will use the common denominator for a in this particular case. It's b squared minus multiply 4a by c. It's 4ac divided by 4a. It's a little easier. All right? So this is r. And I have to divide it by a. So I will have b squared minus 4ac divided by 4a and times a, it's 4a squared. And the second solution, x2, is equal to almost the same thing, except it's not, it's a minus here. These are my two solutions. Well, the only thing is, I would like to simplify these formulas just a little bit. You see, this is 4a squared, which is a full square of either 2a or minus 2a, right? 2a squared will be 4a squared. Minus 2a squared will always be, uh, uh, also will be 4a squared. So, um, I don't know what sign of a actually has, but you see, I have two solutions here, plus and minus. So it doesn't really matter what sign of a is, I can always replace this with leaving the square root only from the top part and changing this to a real square root, which is 2a. Since I have plus here and minus here, it's still two solutions. It doesn't really matter what the sign of a is. If a is positive, it will be a solution. Or if A is negative, it's also a solution, which is the same thing, right? But now this is to A and this is to A, so it makes sense just to have a common denominator. These are two solutions to our original quadratic equation. Minus b plus square root of b squared minus 4ac, and minus b minus square root of uh, b squared minus rc. And obviously, the whole thing exists only if a 
as we see, this is another solution. If you remember, in terms of R and S, we were always um, putting R greater or equal to zero. Well, basically, that's the same thing, but in terms of A, B, and C. <clears throat> so this is a condition for quadratic equation to have two different or the same, maybe, if it's equal to zero, square roots, uh, solutions to, square, uh, to, to uh, quadratic equations. Now, this is a condition for an equation to be quadratic, because if it's, if it's A is, is equal to zero, then it's not a quadratic equation. And this is a condition of quadratic equation having solutions. If it's uh, strictly greater than zero, these are two different numbers, obviously, and it's two different solutions. If it is equal to zero, which is B squared minus 4AC is zero, then we have two solutions which are really one and the same, because it's plus zero or minus zero. A is not equal to zero, and so there is nothing wrong with having uh, A in the denominator. Well, as an exercise, I would definitely ask you to substitute x1 and x2 both in this original equation and check that this is indeed um, solutions. So if you will substitute this, square the whole thing times a plus whatever is necessary, you will really get zero in this case as well as in this case. Um, now, um, just to jump a little bit forward, we will probably spend some time to solving this equation in uh, the domain of complex numbers. In the domain of complex numbers, we don't really need to, um, to have this restriction because in the domain of complex numbers, square root of any negative number exists, like square root of minus 1, for instance. It's i uh, in, ter in terms of complex numbers. So um, what's interesting is that quadrat quadratic equation always has solutions in the area of complex numbers. In the uh, domain of uh, real numbers, it's only under this condition. OK, <clears throat> that's good. And uh, we will spend some time to um, analyze the geometrical interpretation of these solutions. So let's go to geometry. Uh, I think I will use, again, the same approach of starting with something simple and then going into a little bit more complicated cases. So let me put these formulas on the side. Actually, I don't think they will be needed anyway, as well as this condition. And let's just think about this particular equation. Well, first of all, I would like to uh, to graph this left part of this equation as a function. So if I have a function y equals 2, and in this case I will use uh, uh, the r and s representation because they are absolutely equivalent. We know that r and s are expressed as a and b, so it's easier for me to write it in this way. as I did before, because I know that R and S is still expressed as A, B, and C. It's, it's some numbers. It doesn't really matter. A, B, and C numbers, so S and R are also numbers in A. Um, so I will use this as a, um, uh, as a basis, as a foundation for, for this analysis, graphical analysis. Let's draw this particular function uh, on the coordinates. x, y. All right. So, step number one, plane parabola. So, you know that this is an even, number, an even function, even which means it's symmetrical. If yeah, this is minus 1, this is 1, this is 1, it goes like this. This is y is equal to x squared. Great. What's next step? Next step is y is equal to x minus s squared. What does it mean? 
Well, if you remember what happens with the graph of this function relative to this function, well, the whole graph is shifted towards the right. So if this is s, then the whole graph will look like this. Not very symmetrical. Let me try again. OK, maybe that's better. So it's also symmetrical relative to this axis rather than this. Well, why is that? Why is that? Well, obviously, if, if function is x minus s squared, then it takes exactly the same value for x equal s as the original function takes with x equal to 0. Whatever this function takes in s plus 1, let's say, is the same as the original one function in uh, x is equal to 1, etc. Everything is just shifted to the right by s. OK, that's great. That's first transformation. Now, the second transformation is multiplication by a. OK, what happens with the graph if we multiply it by a? Well, if a is, let's say, 2, then we're stretching vertically um, uh, two times. So 0 remains 0. But whatever was 1, for instance, will become 2. Whatever was uh, 4 will become 8, etc. So the graph will be steeper. So it will be like this. But that's only if A is positive. If A is negative, then everything is more or less the same, but the horns of, of this parabola will go down. That's the only difference. But in any case, it's vertically stretching A times. And again, if A is positive, the horns will remain going upwards, and if A is negative, the horn will, horns will reverse their direction. So, just for simplicity, let's assume that A is positive, and so this will be our graph. Okay. Now minus R. So that's another transformation. What happens with the function if we subtract R from it? Well, obviously, the graph will go down by r in this case. And again, let's assume r is positive. Then down means really down. Because if r is negative, subtracting r means actually shifting it up. So in this particular case, again, for simplicity, let's uh, assume that r is positive. Then this is minus r. So the whole parabola will go this way. OK, now let me draw everything but the last piece, because now it looks really messy. So the last piece is 0xy. This is s. This is minus r. This is the focal point of the, our graph. And then it goes upwards. This is our parabola. Now, what are the roots of this equation? Equation of a times x minus s square minus r is equal to 0. Well, obviously, that's where y is equal to 0. This is y-axis. This is y is equal to 0. So wherever this parabola crosses the, the x-axis, that's two solutions. Well, again, that's a very simple case. That's in case uh, r is greater than 0 and s is greater than 0. Now, what happens if um, our r in this particular case is uh, negative? 
Well, if r is negative, then the parabola will go instead of down, will go up, because minus and then the negative will be positive uh, number, so the whole graph will shift up. Now, if the graph shifts up instead of down, there will be no solutions. And this is exactly equivalent to the case when we were saying that, if you remember, b squared minus 4ac should be greater or equal to 0. r and s being expressed in terms of a, b, and c result in exactly the same type of uh, restriction. So this restriction for a, b, and c and these restrictions for r and s are really equivalent because if you will basically do the arithmetic back to whatever I was expressing R and S in terms of A, B, and C, you will see that these two will probably be equivalent something, uh, to something like this. This is not the only um, kind of uh, uh, restrictions which we are really have to make, but the most important one is actually uh, uh, R restriction for R, because S is just shift horizontally back and forth, but R greater than zero in this particular case this is really supposed to be equivalent to this. And if you remember what R actually was, then you will see that that's exactly the case. Um, so, um, having or not having solutions um, in the graphical form is quite obvious. It's basically this parabola having these two chords, whether the horns cross the x axis or they don't. Now, one interesting point, remember, what if b squared minus 4ac is equal to 0? If you remember, this is under the square root in the formula of the solutions of, uh, of this particular equation. And uh, uh, from the formula, it's actually one solution instead of two, because it's plus square root and minus square root, square root is equal to 0 from this expression, so basically it's the same solution. Now, considering what this is actually representing, it represents r, so if r is equal to zero, the parabola doesn't shift from the original position. So instead of going up or down, if r is equal to zero, it stays, it stays put vertically, and it's still this. And it has only one touching point. So that's the only point where we have only one solution. So as soon as r is positive, or which is the same thing, b squared minus 4ac greater than 0, probably goes down. And there are two solutions. In case r is negative, probably goes up, and there is no solution. And finally, if r is equal to 0, there is only one solution. So this r, um, which is related to this formula, uh, is exactly uh, uh, the value of this r determines whether parabola will or will not have any solutions, or if it does, that it's one or two solutions. By the way, considering if solutions are, if there are two solutions, um, what happens with parabola being a little bit lower like this and then moves up which means r is diminishing its in its value the parabola will move up and these two roots will start um, approaching each other so there are still two all the time up until the point when r is exactly equal to zero that's why in this particular case, sometimes this solution is called a double point, basically. Yes, it's still one point, but it represents a limit case uh, for all those parabolas where there are really two points of uh, crossing the, uh, the x-axis. So sometimes uh, even the solution is only single in case this is equal to zero. We are saying that this is a double solution just to basically represent that this is a limiting case. Well, that concludes our um, lecture about uh, quadratic equations. Um, there will be some exercises, and uh, uh, maybe
maybe we will spend some time in the future for uh, complex solutions to quadratic equations. Well, that's it for today. Thank you very much.